Well, hello once again. Dr. J. Smith here concerning the Aramaic antecedents to the Quran, which has surprisingly been quite popular. These videos that I have been putting up uh, just this week. The first one looking and asking the questions concerning Doc, Dr. Gunter Luling's book, this one right here, Challenge to Islam for Reformation, not a good title, as I've said uh, many times through. It's really this statement down here, rediscovering and reconstructing uh, Christian hymnals hidden in the Quran. That's really what this book is about. Huge book that uh, was, well, because of us, was brought into English so that we could all read it. I hope some of you have bought it. And we then moved into this book here, the Syro-Aramaic reading of the Quran that came subsequent to that by Christoph Luxemburg. Dr. Christoph Luxemburg, both of these gentlemen from Germany, thanks to the Germans who are seem to be ahead of the, uh, of the rest of the world when it comes to understanding the Aramaic antecedents. But a third book that I introduced was this one here, uh, the Quran misinterpreted, mistranslated, and misread by Gabriel Soma. This is the third one uh, that we're introducing, and I'll be saying more about that in this, this video here. Now, as I've been introducing the theme, the theme is, of course, that when you look at the poetry, when you look at the, the strophes, this poetry that is in the Quran, roughly a third of the Quran, 33% of the Quran, people like Dr. Gunther Luling back in the 1970s, the last century, was able to reconstruct them by finding their antecedents in pre-Islamic Christian hymns in Syro Aramaic. The same thing was done then by uh, Christoph Luxemburg and also by Gabriel Soma. Now, Gabriel Soma is a Syriac scholar. He is Syriac. Uh, he, he, that is his native tongue. He also speaks fluent Hebrew and also speaks fluent Arabic having grown up in that part of the world. So he is from that tradition, the Aramaic tradition. Therefore, in some ways, he is the first and we should have been going to because he knows it better than anybody else. It's part of his whole tradition. It's part of his heritage, you might say. The Germans have just come on later in the game because they are scholars and they're doing it from a scholarly standpoint within in the institution of academia and have been vilified for it. Look at the story of Gunther Luling, what happened to him. And then, of course, Christoph Luxemburg, that's not even his name. He can't even use his name because of the vilification that's coming on them as Western scholars who are doing their work in Western academia. For, but what's fascinating as I've been reading the comments, and this is why I'm doing this video, reading those comments from many of you, the question keeps coming up, okay, okay, we understand, yes, Dr. Smith, okay, we, we know that this is a problem, we see that this is going on, but we don't see examples. Where are the examples? Where are all these myriad of examples? Where is the 33% of the Quran uh, where they have found these antecedents, these parallels from earlier material from, in this case, Aramaic material. Well, that's why it's obvious to do that, we're going to have to open the books. And let me just start with Gunter Luling, and let's just do that. And what I want to do is give you some examples of this, and then I will be going to and giving you some examples by my friend Murad. Murad, uh, who is in the Middle East, who has gone through this book, and in fact uh, is going up on his site, and I'll say more about him, and putting up example after example. He's put up, I think, five examples already where you can find these Aramaic antecedents. But what is it we're talking about? Well, let's do some quotes, quotes from Gunther Luling. Let's start with Gunther Luling, and I'll put this quote up to begin with. The text of the Quran, he says, as transmitted by Muslim orthodoxy, contains, hidden behind it as a ground layer and considerably scattered throughout it, together about one-third of the whole Quranic text, an originally pre-Islamic Christian text. So what he's saying basically is, folks, <laughs> if you look real hard, you're going to find an awful lot of Christian text within the Quranic text. So you say, okay, so what's the problem here? Why 
is this a difficulty for the Quran? <laughs> it's a real difficulty for the Quran because remember, for everything that Muslims have told us about the Quran, everything they've told us about this book, the Quran, for 1400 years, is that it is eternal. Uh, it cannot have any human intervention or manipulation or correction or corruption. That's in chapter 10, verse 15. That's in chapter 18, verse 27. It is eternal. That's in chapter 85, verse 22. The Quran is very clear. It makes that point. And that Allah himself will preserve it. So how can you suddenly have all these pieces of literature, these hymns written by people that are right, riddled right through the Quran? You can't have hymns in the Quran if this book is eternal. Only that which is scripture can be included in the Quran itself. And it has to be something that has been, well, has been long before the 8th century, the 6th, 7th century, long before any Christians would have had any chance to interpose into it. Remember, these hymns are written by Christians, written in the Aramaic, many of them like St. Ephraim from the 4th century, and in the 5th century, and in the 6th century, up until the 7th century. So these hymns have been there for, well, for a good a few hundred years. In fact, we're going to see that. Let's look at this quote, because this quote then goes on. Look and see what Luling says next. Or in particular, this ground layer is constituted by a pre-Islamic erstwhile Christian Arabic strophic hymnody. In his English edition of 2003, that's uh, Luling's edition, as well as in his second edition, edited uh, edition of 2011, Luling even claims that these texts would have been 200 years old by the time the prophet Muhammad would have received them or written them down. Now, of course, what he's saying here, and this is something that uh, both uh, Hundhammer and Luling are very clear on, and that is that the text that whoever wrote it down, now they're giving credit to Muhammad. I wouldn't give credit to Muhammad. I think you know why. I think many of us today are realize that Muhammad had nothing to do with this. Whoever put the Quran together were scholars. They were Arabic scholars, possibly not even in the 7th century, but possibly as late as the 8th and 9th century, borrowing these Christian Aramaic texts. But listen, uh, this is the 1970s, so of course, Luling and uh, Hundhammer uh, are going. Hundhammer, excuse me, are going to come to their supposition. In their supposition, this was written by Muhammad. So what they're saying is this material that Muhammad, whoever put the Quran together, whoever actually compiled it, whoever that person was, this material that he's compiling was around for over two hundred years and in constituted a good third of the Quran. What else? does he say. Let's continue on uh, with reading. And here is what Gunther Luding says. Today it stands beyond question, details for corroboration will be given later, that the Chris rich Christian Ethiopian hymnody of the early 6th century, one century before Muhammad, goes back in the main to Christian Coptic originals, sometimes corresponding word for word across hundreds of troughs, that means verse by verse by verse by verse, the sequence of which is neatly maintained. Frequent misunderstandings of the Coptic original in the Ethiopic translations result without any possible doubt from typical misunderstandings of an ambiguous Arabia text minus its diacritical consonants, points and vowels and strokes. This indicates that these voluminous Ethiopian strophic texts of around 500 CE which stem from Coptic sources must have passed through the Central Arabian stage of a likewise voluminous but lost pre-Islamic Christian Arabic strophic hymnody. Okay, so basically what he's saying here is that when you look at all of the, the strophes upon strophe of verses upon verses, when you look and see what where they have come through, starting with this material that is over a hundred years before Muhammad, before it was compiled. Now remember, that's taken from even earlier Coptic texts. So that's where this 200 years or even earlier. I mean, some of it, it goes back to St. Ephraim from the 4th century. So that's a good 300 years earlier. This material that is then incorporated and taken from this Ethiopic text, incorporated and put into the Quran as we have today, is what he is talking about. And he's, he's referring to the, uh, the fact that these are the hymns that finally make their way down. Now, 
what is interesting, he then goes on and he puts the, the, these texts, this transmitted text that finally made its way into the Quran, he puts it into four categories. And this is where looting is very good. Uh, he puts it into four distinct categories to help us realize that there's an evolution even within the Quran that we have today. And let's go through each one of these four categories to understand where looting is coming from. The first one, he says, because also historically the oldest, this is the text of the pre-Islamic Christian strophic hymnody. So that's the, that's the initial material that is being used by, by whoever is putting together the Quran. This is that initial, this is what is being borrowed from. Hidden in the ground layer, now that means the razam, that's a consonant, without diacritical points and without strokes to indicate the vowels. So that would just be the bare uh, consonantal text we know that is called razam in Arabic. And then covered up by a new opinionated Islamic reinterpretation pressed on the ambiguous razam ground layer of the, and he calls it the erstwhile Christian text, as we shall call them for brevity. So that first category would be the original text. That's the original erstwhile, he calls it Christian text, the original Aramaic text. Then he goes on to the second category. Second and historically later, there is the layer of the text of the willful new Islamic interpretation pressed on the ground layer of the erstwhile Christian strophic text. We shall call them henceforth second sense Quranic texts. These constitute the other and historically oldest one-third of the transmitted Quran text. So now we get the Arabic being pressed on into these borrowed Aramaic texts. These he calls second sense Quranic texts. So here is the, orig the original, you might say the first attempt at making, taking it from Aramaic and putting it into Arabic. And this is the beginning of what we now see as the Quran. So that's the second category. And then he goes into a third category. The third, and historically contemporary to this second layer, the texts which are, from their coming into existence onward, pure Islamic texts, that is, texts, the ground layer, razam, of which have been written directly and solely for the expression of the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad. We shall call them, henceforth, single-sense Quranic texts. And they make up about two-thirds, goodness sakes, we're talking about two-thirds of the Quran. So almost all of the Quran, this is this 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 third category, uh, that the remaining parts of the Quran. Yeah. So basically what he's saying here is the original writers, he says it's Muhammad, I would suggest it's probably a committee of different people from different categories, from different even locations and geographical locations. These individuals who are putting together the Quran, this is their first attempt at a Quran, a recitation. So this is the beginning now of the recitation as they would put it. And of course, it, they have an agenda and their agenda is very Islamic. And so they are starting to, uh, I guess the, the, when you look at his book, you'll see they are starting to push out, turn, change, manipulate the words that they're getting to introduce their own words, their own narrative, their own phraseology. So that's the third category. Then we get into the fourth. And what is the fourth? As he says, unfortunately, also these single sense texts, this third text category conveying the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad, have often been essentially reinterpreted by post Muhammadan Quran editors in such a way that the originally intended ideas of the Prophet got totally lost. And that often a, a horrible, almost incomprehensibly distorted text was the result. So, this, uh, I would suggest, is he didn't call it this. He didn't put a date on it. I would suggest this is what we know as the Abbasid narrative, narration, the Abbasid narrative. Uh, we've seen this with so much of the traditions. Uh, we've seen this also. Why would we be surprised, therefore, that this also exists with the Quran itself? So those four categories are good. So you start with the Christian, uh, the Christian Aramaic text, the rudimentary text from which this material is borrowed. Then you get it put into Arabic, but it still uses many of the same names, many of the same words, many of the same phraseology, just redone into Arabic text. And then the third category is, I would say, the Umayyad imposition, where the Umayyads now start putting an Islamic meaning 
taking out words and putting their own words, taking out dots, putting their own dots, changing the words. And Gunther Luding does an awful lot of example after example after example where they just started to distorted the text. And that was the third category. And then the fourth category, or the fourth, uh, uh, you might say, evolution of the Quran is when the, uh, the uh, Abbasids themselves, so pa after 750, the later part of the 8th century, 9th century, maybe even to the 10th century, where they then completely distort the text, uh, the text itself <clears throat> putting their own phrases so that what comes out of it is their own narrative. A very much a narrative that has nothing more to do with Jesus Christ, has nothing more to do with the homilies or the hymns or the uh, lectionaries that were originally there. And now these are all praises to the Prophet, the Nabi, the Rasul, the Rami, the Rasul, the, the praised one. Uh, the praise one which is found four times which uh, they would uh, say is a person named Muhammad so this is all getting back now to a narrative that they wanted to have as their own so you can see you can see this evolution from the seventh century into the beginning of the Umayyad uh, period uh, where the Arabic is first introduced and then from the uh, time of Abdul Malik uh, Walid coming on over into the later Umayyad period uh, the early parts of the eighth century uh, where you have a, a starting to form the, the an, uh, an Islamic ideal and then finally when that is then con uh, changed into a completely Islamic ideal with a completely Abbasid overlay in the fourth category that's very helpful now he gives the example of chapter 96 and i would suggest people do go and look at chapter 96 uh, you can find it on page 60 and on uh, in this book here where Gunther Lin goes does a good job of just unpacking chapter 96 uh, this whole thing with the alaka the word alaka the the blood the clot the blood clot the embryological problem and what's fascinating is he gives then of 25 different examples of that in his book. I would suggest get the book and look at these 25 rather than me try to unpack each one. It would take hours and hours and hours. I don't think I'm even capable of it because I don't understand the Aramaic like others, like Salma does or like Murad does, as he does later on. So I would suggest you just go ahead and buy the book and open up to these pages. Now before I go any further and I move on to the other books, I want to say something about Dr. Gunther Ludwig's book. Remember, I have been pushing this book, well, for almost a year. This book here, Challenge to Islam, that I've been putting up over and showing you over and over and over again. Well, this was actually the one that I've been pushing, that I've been asking you to buy. And since the time a year ago when Thomas Alexander uh, came onto Fander Films and we introduced this and... Uh, Thomas did a great job of unpacking what the background to it and also the history behind what happened in 1970 with Dr. Gunther Ling when uh, this was his doctoral thesis and he got expunged uh, from the academia there in Germany, though he got Eximium Opus, the highest grade you can get for this book, and was then resurrected because we got this translated into English, which then got Dr. Luning all over the world. This book has resurrected Dr. Luling's reputation, as a result of which he died a happy man in 2014. We, last year, a year ago, so we're talking about October in 2021, we really pushed you to buy this and get it because we were sure it was going to go out of print. Well, we did such a good job of pushing this book. Thomas Alexander did it, I did it, Al Fadi did it. Uh, I think maybe others had done it, but we were the primary ones who really were telling you to buy this book. Well, so many of you bought this book that the the junkie das. Let me just get that the Banar Sidas Motilal Banar Sidas publishers in India ran out of copies. Amazon couldn't get any more copies. So what they do? Well, they went and reprinted it. This has just come out in 2022. It's just been out one or two months, and here I just got it yesterday. I finally got it. This is the same book, but this is the newer edition. Here's the old edition, and here's the new edition, which means we're doing our job correctly. So many of you have bought this book that they've had to reprint. And I looked at it just when I got it yesterday, and it's page for page the same as that. 
but this is the 2011 reprint that has been had to be reprinted again in 2022 with a whole new cover i think a much better looking cover and what's good about it is though it has the title here here is really what the whole book's about the rediscovery and reliable reconstruction of a comprehensive pre-islamic christian hymnal hidden in the quran under earliest islamic reinterpretation so they have put that at the top they've been listening to us and i'm so glad that they've had to reprint it proving that it does do well for us to get these books and to buy them because it keeps the authors not only their names in print but also this material thank goodness for all of you and i want to thank all of you who have bought this book you're doing luling a favor you're doing us a favor and you're making sure uh, that multilal has to continue to reprint this book there in india in delhi for the sake of others who need to read it now i wish many muslims would buy this book so they can read it and see how damaging this is but thank you all of you for buying this book and having forcing them or not forcing them but encouraging them to reprint it for our sake god bless you okay now for those of you who are asking where are these they're, examples they're all through his book it's a huge book he does actually he gives 25 examples of what he's talking about go and look now here's a graph look at this graph here and just walk let me walk it through with you here's a graph that explains where his examples are if you want to find examples look at page 52 and you'll he shows you where surah 107 where is the antecedent to surah 107 in aramaic text if you look at page 60 uh, he then unpacks and it continues on for quite a few pages after that he talks about surah 96 verses 13 to 14 page 74 is chapter 3 and also references from 79 and 80 uh, um, page 83 is surah 5 and also 60 to 65 and then from pages 91 to 95 again read back, coming back to chapter 96 a very important one because of the changes of the words that were used between the aramaic and the arabic there and then you continue can you i want to read them all down but you can see on page 108 is six, chapter 67 coming on down to pages 305 to 38 is chapter 26 verse 52 to 67 and then page 319 to 331 is chapter 26 again uh, verses 78 to 92 and all the way down to all the way to near the end pages 509 to 512 you get the examples of the aramaic of uh, the arabic se uh, chapter 74 verses 1 to 30 and where the aramaic is found that's where gunther luning is very helpful so he does give you example he doesn't just give you theory although the theory is important so that you understand how is it you can then read the text then look at the examples no. so in conclusion how has gunther luling in his germinal work for his doctoral thesis how has he helped us uh, well his book his thesis was very clear that the original quran actually came out of much of it probably a third of it came from the aramaic hymns these beautiful hymns written by christian in aramaic in the fourth fifth and sixth century that's pretty clear and that's one reason why it was so disturbing for the academic hierarchy there in germany in 1970 that even with the eximium opus he had to be thrown out of the academic institutions out of the whole system was not given a professorship and was left in obscurity until we resurrected him by bringing him into English. This is why we're doing all of this in English, and this is why we're asking the Germans to send all their material to us so that we can translate it into English so that you can hear it. Because once it gets out of the German academia into the much wider English-speaking academia, uh, it then it then has a life of its own. What, was, what Gunther Lulling helped us with is not only to show us that these, these stories came from hymns, which in and of itself eradicates any notion that this could come from Allah or that this has been eternal or this has been existed on these eternal tablets for e, uh, from t a time immemorial, well, before time. That throws that out of the notion, but also that this is something that came from Muhammad or this came from uh, Uthman in 652, Muhammad earlier, because we know that these were all written not in Arabia, not in Mecca or Medina. These were written by christians and these are hymns that they sung in church uh, these are well-known hymns and that's one reason why they're so damaging to this notion uh, that the quran 
is external to any other piece of literature, better than any other piece of literature, and is the seal of all previous literature, all previous revelations. These are not revelations. Hymns are written by men. They're written for the rest of us to sing in church. That's why they're, they're great, and they're fun, and they're exciting, and I love to sing them, but you cannot equate them with Scripture, and you do not put them alongside revelation uh, as coexisting eternally and authoritative. So this is that was thrown out. But then what he did is he helped us by showing the sequence that went along, the sequence of how this happened. Taking these original Arabic texts, which came from Ethiopic texts, which were originally, which were uh, nothing more than borrowings from even earlier Coptic texts, Coptic texts that were from the 4th, 5th uh, century. Then they were taking that Arabic text, the first uh, uh, the first thing to do was then to put it into Arabic, and that was the second category that he talks. So the first category are the Arabic texts, from the borrowed from the original Coptic texts. Then secondly, made into Arabic, translated into Arabic as best they could. Now we don't have those because that doesn't exist today. That is something that has been lost. We would love to get a hold of those original Arabic manuscripts. See, we don't have any of those because all the manuscripts we have are from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century, much later. The Topkapi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Petropolinus, the Husseini manuscript, and the Sana'a manuscript. Those six major manuscripts that we've talked about ad nauseum here on Fander Films, those are 8th, 9th, and 10th century manuscripts. They are not those original Arabic scripts. We would love to be able to get them. However, 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 they are consonantally the same. And that's why, consonantally concerning, uh, as far as we're concerned, that is good because that is a window into that area. So that was the second category, or the second sequence in the evolution of the Quran, is what Gunther Lulling was saying. Then he went on to a third one where the Umayyads, and he didn't really call them Umayyads, he was, was really talking about Muhammad at this time, and he was talking about the Muhammad text. We know it wasn't Muhammad, it's probably other scholars. They were starting to put this overlay, this Islamic overlay, starting to change the vowel trying to change the dots so that they were taking out and eradicating all these hymns to Jesus they were throwing out and putting uh, not instead of hymns these are poems beautiful poetry but they had much more to do with nubbies and rasuls and prophets this and prophet that who lived here and did this and did that and all the different things the responsibilities of the believers that then was the third uh, sequence but then he went into a fourth sequence which he didn't he just talked about a, a, a corruption by later Arab scholars. Well, we know who those later Arab scholars are, and these are would be the Abbasids. So that would be post-749. The Abbasids come into power in 749. That's the mid-8th century. So anything after the mid-8th century is where they have then taken and they have corrupted it once again. And these are the corruptions that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be giving you some examples of these corruptions. I call them adulterations. I even, in some cases, call them bastardization of what was earlier. But that's to come. Hold on. We're going to get to that. Uh, we're going to be looking at two surahs in particular to unpack that. So that's the latest, the, the fourth uh, evolution. That's where Gunther Luding has been so helpful, and that's why he was so dangerous, and that's why his thesis was so damaging, and that's why you need to get his book. This is the earliest, the latest rendition and from 2022, from this year itself. So buy it, get it up, because we need to make sure that all of you start learning this material so that you can use it, and you Muslims, you've got to learn it as well. What Gunther Luding did there in the 1970s really did damage the Quran, uh, and no wonder uh, no one wants to go through what Gunther Luling did, but we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen again. As long as it's in English, the whole world can read it. And as long as the whole world can read it, can hold Muslims accountable to it. Because Muslims, it is not your Arabic Quran that is the earliest Quran. It is the Aramaic Quran that precedes it that we want to get to. And you're going to have to learn Aramaic to get back to the Ur Quran, the pre-existing the Quran, the antecedent to the Quran. And that's why we thank Gunther Luding for what he has done. Now in the next segment, we're going to go unpack and look more at Salman's book and then of Christoph Luxemburg's book. But let's end this segment off here before we get into Salman's book, uh, which is we're going to get help from Murad, our good friend Murad from the Middle East to help us with that. Until the next episode, this is Jay, over now. Mm -hmm.